I know you read a lot in the uh, Old Testament. I know you've read all these uh, minor prophets that we're going to be looking at in the weeks ahead. Um, oh, no? Oh, well then, <laughs> well, then let me read your passage for you. Now, the thing I, I need to tell you is, uh, as a preacher for a lot of years, I kind of avoid this part of the Bible. Um, because... I'm, I'm sort of a negative guy to begin with, so I really go to, I like it, you know, but then I figure out, how do you bring good news out of this? Um, and it's very strong and, um, and very powerful, and it causes us to stop and think and look at our lives and go, um, what is God inviting us to? What is he calling us to? And, and, and what makes God furious? So... Uh, beginning of verse 5 of Amos, verse, uh, chapter 5, verse 21. This is God speaking. I hate, that's a good start, isn't it? I hate, I despise your religious feasts. I cannot stand your assemblies. Even though you bring me burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. <laughs> Though you bring choice fellowship offering, I have no regard for them. Away with the noise of your songs, I will not listen to the music of your harps. I had to warn a harp player, actually, today. <laughs> that was coming. She, she specified that the, that the Hebrew harp is different than the Irish harp. You know. <laughs> I will not listen to the music of your harps, but, get this, let justice roll. Let it roll on like a river. Let righteousness, like a never-ending stream, roll down. But we see what God hates and we see what God longs for us to have. So pray with me. Lord Jesus, teach us from, from your word. Teach us from this strong uh, passage how we might follow you, how, how we might know you and, and live differently because of your uh, presence in our life. That's our prayer today, in Jesus' name. Um, I, I picked Amos as the first um, prophet for us to look at because he was actually historically the first one of, of the group. And, um, and the thing that struck me about him was that he was not a minister, he was not a professional prophet, he was a, a total amateur. In fact, uh, the, the book of Amos, he describes himself as a, kind of a part-time sheep herder and also later on in the book, he describes himself as a uh, 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 like a migrant worker. He, he was he picked figs uh, in the little town of Tekoa, and uh, so here he was, a you know part-time sheep herder and a part-time migrant working fig picker, and uh, <laughs> and he finds himself getting a word. He didn't have a word of his own. This was like a word of the Lord that he was supposed to take to this to. Uh, Israel to the center of uh, power, the center of worship, the center of uh, business and economics, and um, the center of political power. He's supposed to go there in the heart of that, this fig picker, and bring the word of the Lord. Picture that, the, the, the mission that he has. So I, I was really interested to see what he would do and uh, how he would handle this. Because, you know, how would you do it if this was something that was asked of you? You know, go to Olympia or Washington, D.C. or something and, and go and uh, go to Wall Street and, and bring a word of the Lord. How would you do it? How would you get in? You know? Uh, and so uh, he had a brilliant, brilliant strategy. And uh, it's kind of subtle, but it was it's really good. If you look at the first few chapters, what he does is... <laughs> He, he goes to the gates of the city, the outside, and he says, I have a word from the Lord, and he talks about all the bad things that are going on in the neighboring country. Just, just, this God is so mad at our neighbors, and they're terrible people, and they're doing everything wrong, and so, well, come on inside the gate. Talk some more. So he comes inside the gate, and he says, well, let me tell you about more. There's not just that country, how about this other country, our other neighbor, neighbor to the north, let's talk about them, and God's really mad at them, and they've done everything wrong, and people go, this, we've got to take him to see the king, 
he's really got an important message. So he gets, so then he moves in further into the power circle. He goes through about four or five of the neighboring countries and just, you know, God is furious at everything they're doing. And then he gets in to the center of all the power and says, God has a word for Israel. And by now, they're so used to him, you know, smashing the neighbors. Let's hear it. What's God have to say about us? And then, oh my goodness, disobedience, unfaithfulness, impending judgment, problems in their political system. They're comfortable. They had kind of a post-war prosperity going on. Uh, everything on the surface was wonderful, except in reality, all their comfort and security that they had was at the cost of uh, pressing down and, and hurting the poor. And they didn't care because they had their comfort. And they had big worship rituals and big celebrations and everybody loved to come to, you know, the big, big uh, religious ceremonies. And that was all really great. And God says, I just hate it. I hate it. I, I just hate what you're doing and how you're living and how you're relating to me and how you're relating to the, to the, those who are weaker. <laughs> And, they, and the people kind of reel back and go, oh, I didn't think that was coming to us. We th and I thought about that. I thought, you know, if we could just badmouth those people from Oregon, you know, God's got a word for them. You know what they're like. And, or, or those Canadians. Sorry, Kay. I know you are one. But, you know, if we could just talk about those Canadians and what they're like out there. And, oh, heaven knows, you know, folks from Idaho. But um, uh, Mexico, let's go there. And it's really easy to see the problems on the people a little bit away from us. And yet, when there's a word from the Lord, it's saying, okay, but what about us? What about our lives? What about our uh, response to God? What about our relationships with the people around us? How are we going to live? And, uh, and we get challenged in this. And, uh, and it's a very strong, very strong challenge. And God says, you know, you know what I want? I want justice to roll down like a mighty river. I want righteousness to flow like a never-ending stream. That's what I want. That's going to be the evidence of your relationship with me. That's going to be the, the tangible evidence. Bring that as an offering instead of uh, this big uh, pious show, you know. And, uh, and that's what he tells us. Now, I look at this and I go, okay, what does this... What can we get out of this? Because I don't want to just go through a list of all the things that, you know, we're probably doing wrong, or I'm doing wrong at least, um, and not leave you hope. But what is it that this is telling us? And so the first thing that comes to my mind is uh, Amos, this guy, uh, models for us a really important thing, and that is that there is power in the ministry of the amateurs. And uh, uh, I had a friend who used to say, there's nothing wrong with the church that getting rid of all the ministers wouldn't uh, fix. I, which I took personally, actually, you know. But so don't listen to that very much. But, but you think about this. Here, here is Amos. God is going to speak his word to the people and to the powerful and to the religious and to all these areas of life. He's going to bring his word and he picks what we would think is the least likely candidate to bring that message. Isn't that strange? Um, the least likely. And we think about that and we go, how often have we left um, <coughs> ministry, our lives, our, our communities, the way we treat people? We've left that to the professionals to figure out. That's somebody else's job. And I think that this, uh, this book, uh, Amos, is showing us that there's real power in each one of us becoming a prophet where, where we are. Now, a prophet is uh, someone who just speaks God's word into a situation or into life. And so when... Um, Nobody would look at Amos and say, you know, he's very learned, and he, he, I wonder where he read this, and, uh, or he came up with these ideas that he's sharing. Nobody would do that. They, they go, it must be God's word, because he's just a migrant worker. What would he know? And I think that's what happens when 
uh, people see us and go, but I know them. Why are they sharing what God can do in, in our lives? Why are they getting involved in, in ministry and making things happen? Um, that's why, for example, um, when we did the kingdom assignment, remember that? It's been so many weeks ago. We, uh, we passed out the $5,000 to y'all in $100 bills, and uh, many of you took them. And, uh, and then you weren't allowed to say, for example, come to me and say, what should I do with my money, Pastor? Because you have a good idea of that. You know, I was a little offended that none of you actually came to me and wanted me to tell you what to do, you know, but, but nobody did. And, uh, and you went out and found ways to bless people uh, in a kingdom way, to, to, to help them, to serve them, to let them know that God loves them and they're important. And you did that, each of you, in different ways and used the money. And sometimes the money multiplied and became more than what it started with. And, and sometimes the ministries got bigger and more complicated than you thought it would be at the time. And uh, all of those things. And what did we learn from that? Ministry is not what happens when you come in here on Sunday. You know, it's not about coming in and going, well, you know, I did church this week. Okay, you know, it's what we do as God's people out there. And you were a prophet as you took that hundred bucks and uh, said, okay, Lord, what is it you want me to do? And some of you told me that you'd, you'd spend weeks kind of praying about it. Then you couldn't, you wanted to get the right thing. You didn't want to just, you know... <clears throat> give it back because <laughs> you couldn't do that so um but you spent weeks praying about it going what should i what you know and, and then i get an idea maybe maybe you should do this that's the essence of ministry and that's exactly what uh what we're seeing here in amos In fact, at one point, people said, you know, who are you to bring this message? And, and he said, well, first of all, I'm not a prophet. I'm not the son of a prophet, he says. This is not a, a generational thing, family business. Never been to prophet school, you know. Didn't get that. Didn't get that degree in prophet thing. And that's like an MBA in business. <laughs> but um, he said, none of that. All I am is a guy who takes care of the crops, the fig trees. That's, that's my job. That's my qualification. But I have this word from the Lord. Let me tell you about what God has to say about our lives and what he wants to see happen. And th think of the power in that as, as we go out into our world. Um, you know, some places where you all work, I would never get in. They look at me and go, what are you doing here? And, but you go right in. Isn't that strange? Um, you should see me trying to get into the Boeing offices to, you know, share with them about what God could do in their lives. Or, you know, downtown, I could go to Nordstrom offices, corporate offices. They want to hear from me. Oh, pastor, come in here and talk to us, you know. Karen can get in. They'll let her in because she runs the place, you know. And, and, and they'll listen to her. They won't listen to me as the pastor. And, uh, and there is power in that if we would begin to think that God has put each of us where we are for his purposes, right? That he's got a place for us and we're there and you think, well, what about these people I work with? Why, they're not all believers. Do you know that? Where I work, that there's actually some pagans there? Yeah. And maybe that's why you're there. They've never seen a, a, a follower of Jesus before. They've never had somebody share with them, well, you know, this is what happened in my life, and here's how God got a hold of me, and I was struggling with this, and now I still struggle with it, but I feel like I've got the Lord with me as I'm going through it, you know. We're a powerful witness. It's totally powerful. And, uh, and when the uh, fit, when the when the Professionals come in, you know, we just mess stuff up. I got to tell you, uh, that's why I intentionally said, don't come and ask me, don't, don't, no advice on how to, how to spend your hundred bucks and how to do your ministry. You go do it. Uh, one of my favorite things that uh, I remember, this goes way back because I'm an old guy, but there used to be a company called Farrell's Ice Cream. Remember that? No. 
They, they, they were in the Northwest. They started in, uh, in the Northwest, the, the guy, Mr. Farrell, Don Farrell, I think was his name. And, and he uh, was working with Youth for Christ as a volunteer. And he said, we've got to have a place where families can go, where kids can go and have a blast. And it's, and it's a good atmosphere. And so he started this ice cream parlor. Anybody ever go to a Farrell's in the old days? Oh, this shows how old we are. Yeah. That's what I'm talking about. And they would have, they had, they had the mountain, I think it was. It had like 17 scoops of ice cream and about 47 toppings. And, what was it? Oh, they had the trough, too. Oh, yeah, the zoo. They had the zoo, which... Uh, the, the trough was if you ate the whole thing yourself, you got it free. There's a health thing for you. <laughs> and... Uh, but, but it was when they were ringing the bells, you know, somebody, were, and then these, like, these kids would come out holding the ice cream on their shoulders and running around, and we're all screaming and cheering. I actually went, one of my first dates with Eileen was to a Ferrell's. <laughs> we, we saved the menu, I stole it. <laughs> and, uh, and it was, it was just fun, it was just exciting and fun, and lines down the street because you couldn't get in because everybody was having a blast. Okay, so they, they expanded, they went up and down the West Coast, became a big success, and then Marriott Host Corporation saw this and said, we know restaurants, this is a winner, and they bought it. They bought out Don Farrell, kept the name, kept the places, and said, you know, what we need to do here, we need to turn over the tables. Think of how it's profitable now, but imagine how it'll be if we could get people to leave. If they could eat and leave, you know, they're staying around, they're having fun. So let's knock off this running around, ringing bells and, and laughing and having a good time. Let's change that. Let's, let's, you know, what kind of menu is this? Ice cream. Ah, well, who wants that? And they brought in deli sandwiches and soups and all these things. And, and, uh, and pretty soon, you know, there was no line out front. And pretty soon it was, you went in and it was like going to Denny's, you know, whoopee, first date, you know, and, uh, and then pretty soon it was gone, right? No more Farrell's ice cream. That company bought it, paid huge amounts of money and shut it down because they knew what they were doing and they knew restaurants. That has happened in churches across the, the country, you know. Yeah, yeah, a group of, of folks are following Jesus and trusting him and praying and, and beginning to share together and grow and looking out at their neighborhoods and beginning to care for the people around them and, and, and talking about how the Lord's working in their life and hearing other people's stories and the churches start to grow. And what do they do? They bring in a pastor, a trained professional who's been to seminary and has a doctorate and knows how to do ministry. And then what happens? <laughs> We become like Farrell's ice cream, you know? Uh, we, have, we have an AA group that meets on Friday down there, about 60 people. We've had to bring in extra chairs. AA, but there was a time in America where there was no AA, remember? Everybody just was desperately praying for their mom or their dad or their kid or their uncle or whoever. It couldn't, there was no victory over their addictions and Hospitals couldn't figure it out. Medical people, psychologists, nobody could figure out how to do it. What did it take? Two drunks. Two drunks. To say, well, what would help us? What do we need? Well, you know, and that, that would start. And to this day, there is no uh, professional leading an AA group in America. <laughs> that doesn't happen. That would be the death of it. That would become A and becomes Farrell's ice cream. It's over. But the strength is, folks get together and say, how can we support each other? How can we encourage? How can we help the people around us who are also struggling like we're struggling, right? And then life begins to change. John, this is not part of your sermon, but when you go to a Mariners baseball game, you don't go to play baseball, you go to watch it. And that's part of the strength of AA, is they do it, they don't watch somebody doing it for them. Do you hear what Eric said? And don't ever say that again. No. The, the thing that he said is that when you go to a ball game, you, they're not expected to play. You're expected to watch. That's what it is. But when you go to AA, uh, you don't come to spectate, you come because you're part of it. 
And, and, and you know, the same thing happens, I think, when uh, the people of God gather. And we say, you know, we're followers of Jesus. We're going to gather. We're going to worship the Lord. We're going to uh, encourage each other. Uh, we come not to spectate, but to participate. Thanks for making a point in the sermon for me, Eric. I, uh, <laughs> sometimes the amateurs know exactly what to say. You know, that's the point. So, okay, I just want to talk about the two things here real quick. The, 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 the two-footed uh, ministry. What is it that God wants? He wants justice to roll down like a mighty river, right? And he wants what? Righteousness. Thanks. Well, I'll tell you what, you get an A. <laughs> Righteousness to flow like a never-ending stream. Now, I've been around a long time and watched this dilemma between righteousness and justice. Righteous Anybody seen that dilemma in their own lives or in their own faith, how that's played out? You know, it seems like there's always a, a group of kind of justice freaks. And, and, they're, and they're right. That's the thing I want you to, they are really right. You know, how do we work for the poor? How do we serve? How do we help somebody? And, um, and they've got this one leg thing going, you know? And it's an important one. And they're able to get in and make a difference. And then over on the other side of the church, we've got these people who are really into their righteousness and their, and their personal spirituality and those kind of things, their relationship with Christ. And they don't give a rip about anybody else or what's going on, you know? And so they're, they've got their leg too. And, uh, and so what, the, what we have is this balancing act in which we as a church become unstable, right? We're still upright. I'm not very good with my right leg because I'm left-handed. So let me get over to the justice side. Oh, that's much more comfortable. Yeah, right there. That's where I love to be because I go with my strengths, my left leg. <laughs> no, no, stop there. Stop there. Stop it. So here's the deal. What in the world would happen if we actually had a two-legged faith? For one, we stop hopping around like an idiot, right? We actually become stable. We have a foundation that brings in the care for those who need lifting up, the care for those who have no voice, who, who we become advocates for, and, and we serve the people who need to be served. And we experience and we live out and we share this relationship with God, right relationship. The Bible says Abraham was a friend of God and that was righteousness. But we have this, we're friends with God. We've got both legs. You know, I haven't almost fallen over in 30 seconds here. That's amazing, isn't it? That's what God's calling us to. And that's what Amos is reminds me. I don't need all those big things. I don't need that ceremony. I don't need that superficial stuff. What I need is justice and righteousness together. That's what God's calling us to. And I've got to tell you, this is the time of the amateur. I don't want that kingdom experience to stop. I may not keep giving you $100 bills, but... I don't want it to stop. I want what we did there to continue and to keep looking. How can we serve? How can we help? How can we make a difference in the, in the world around us? So, okay. I'll let you go to lunch. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we love you. We would follow you. We would serve you. And Lord, we confess that we need your forgiveness and we need your correction and we need your, your word in our lives. So give us the courage to trust you and follow you. We'll give you the glory. Amen.